in talking about what's coming up in April and what to look for and uh, and see. So, Carolyn, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for speaking today. Appreciate it. Okay. okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's amazing that you're here and not outside in the sunshine. So. I hope you find this worthwhile today. Um, this is just a section on looking ahead of different possibilities and things to think about uh, in April. And so, let's see if I, my thing's not moving. Um, okay, let's go back a couple here. Where did, how did we do this all of a sudden? Okay, we're going to go from... I'm going to go back to We lost here. it. And I know. I'm seeing that. I'm going from the beginning. And it's there we go. So here's some of the tasks that we're going to cover. You can find a great resource at OSU Garden Tasks for April. And here's some problems to manage in April. Insects, slugs, shrubs that aren't blooming, azalea lace bug, roses, black, stop, black spot and powdery mildew, uh, crown gall, Pear leaf blister mite, the great erinium mite, apple and pear scab, apple anthracnose, peach leaf curl. Nice set of things to deal with. Uh, things that are good to know, weeds, how to ID and manage them, um, including horsetail and then uh, just identifying poison hemlock and giant hogweed. How to deal with spring house plant care, uh, lawn care, getting your garden ready resources and diagnostic resources. So that's what we plan to cover in the next little while. Um, some of you may have had a chance to look uh, at, the, at the classes for February and March. Looking ahead, those are still available if you would like to look at them. There are still these bugs, western box elders, uh, carpet beetles, drugstore beetles, cutworms, and other lawn pests. And I think you'll find those in those previous issues there. So one of the things that some of us are dealing with right now in our house, for example, are ants. They live outside in temporary shallow nests, but they find their way inside. And you can find them marching in lines across your kitchen counter or windowsill, and they're attracted to sweets or food. Um, the ants leave uh, pheromone trails, or some people call them butt trails, so that other ants can find the source of food. So it's important to wipe all your counters clean with a soapy sponge and to remove scent and food, to remove the scent and the food debris. If the problem persists, an organic chemical ant bait is available in gel form such as Taro Ant Killer. I was just talking with someone who's used that and found it very effective. Uh, be sure you read the directions and follow them and keep them away from pets and children. Okay, our friends, the slugs. You know, we always have to deal with them. First of all, water early in the morning so the surface will dry out by evening when they feed. Um, cut down the hiding places. Large bark mulch is a great place for slug hiding places as are wood piles. Clean up. Remove weeds and dead plant debris, rocks. Keep the shrubs pruned off the ground. Plant slug resistant, uh, slug resistant plants. And I was actually amazed looking at this list. I have a number of them in our, in our yard, and it's true, the slugs do not bother them. Aquilagia, uh, Aquilagia, Columbine is how I know them. Astilbes, Astorontias, Begonias, Crocosmias, Euphorbias, Ferbs, Fuchsias, Grass, Hardy Geraniums, Hellebores, and I have a group of Hellebores sitting in, on the grass, and they have been untouched by the slugs. Um, hydrangeas, Japanese anemones, and, and ladies' mantle, lavenders, lilium lilies, um, pelargoniums, and penstemons, roses, and sedums. So there's quite a nice choice of plants that you can plant and not even worry about the slugs eating them. Obviously, you can trap and bait them, as in making pudding uh, pans with yeast or, and water or beer in them, mm -hmm. and... And uh, yeah, and you can use bait crops too to attract them, and then and then uh, trap them that way as well. Um, one of the downsides I find with trapping with beer is if they get in there and they rot, it's a horrible, icky junk you have to pour out. Uh, barriers you can use desiccating barriers, uh, ones that are caustic or rough, um, such as eggshells and wood ash, wood chips, 
lava, rock, cinders, sand, sawdust, ashes, gravel, and diatomaceous earth, not the kind that's used in swimming pools. And researchers at the Agricultural Research Center in Hawaii say that caffeine is a natural slug killer. You spray leftover coffee around, but not on the plants in the garden. And of course, hand picking. You can examine the plants and hand pick where the slugs are found. The best results are at night, a couple hours after sunset, with a flashlight and a soapy bucket. And of course, ducks are wonderful. Chemical controls. There are a variety of things. There's cereal-based mini pellets, and very small pellets, much smaller than the pencil eraser shaped pellets that we're used to. Um, they have the best performance in our rainy climate, and they can last for two to three weeks on wet soil. They're also very palatable to slugs. Always read and follow label uh, directions. We had a class uh, by a researcher um, on cucumbers that they're researching as a bait currently too and seems to be quite attractive to slugs. So if you're trying to gather them to your beer or something, that might be an additional thing. Um, methaldehyde, well, which we, uh, I guess I best know as deadline, is, does not affect beneficial organisms like earthworms and predatory insects and beetles, but it is toxic to dogs and cats and other mammals. Iron phosphate-based products, I know best as Sluggo, uh, they're approved for organic production. They may be toxic to earthworms and dogs if the formulation contains sodium ferric EDTA. I looked up the MSDS sheet on Sluggo, and it does not have that according to the, the MSDS sheet. Salt, you know, which people do use on slugs, you would use that with caution because it can burn plants and leach into the soil. So why aren't my shrubs burning, blooming? Well, it may be how old the slug is. It may take a few years for a young shrub to mature enough to bloom. It could be environmental stress, too much or not enough water, not enough light, water uh, winter kill of the flower buds, and late frost damage to young blossoms. Too much nitrogen fertilizer. This results in making lots of nice green leaves, but no flowers. I might have been responsible for doing that more than once. <laughs> Pruning. During spring, uh, if spring flowering shrubs should be pruned by the end of June at the latest. If you prune them later, you're cutting off next year's flower buds. And if you remove more than a third of the bush when pruning, when you're pruning, it is it's, it's so stressing on the on the plant that the flower buds don't form because it's trying to put out more leaf growth. Um, using the wrong uh, pesticide, herbicide, fungicide may improperly can damage or kill the flower bud beds, the buds. So be sure and read the labels. Um, the number one reason why, why all plants of all kinds fail, including trees and shrubs, is not planting the right plant in the right place. So research before you buy it. Look into its growing requirements, sunlight, soil, watering, drought resistance, hardiness zones. Those make a huge difference in how well your plant is going to bloom. Now, if you're having leaves that look like this with your azaleas or your rhododendrons, it's probably damage caused by azalea leaf bug from last year. Um, you will have a problem this year that eggs will overwinter on the midrib. If you look on the smaller picture, there's an orange uh, little strip. Those are eggs that have been laid. They hatch in mid uh, April, March, it, sorry, mid April to mid March. And this is the time to try to attack them. The first thing is to spray them with a strong spray of water and wash them off. They don't tend to have the strength to go back after that. Um, common rose problems, you know, we do live in a wet climate. And black spot and powdery mildew tend to be two of the things that our roses deal with. A lot. So prune, prune your um, roses so that there's more airflow, which cuts down on the moisture. Yes, honey. Cut out and destroy the diseased canes and leaves, and break up and destroy uh, fallen leaves. Uh, if you, if you look for consistent cultivars, you're going to do better with that. Maybe somebody could mute their mic. Um, if you had a black spot or powdery mildew last year, begin spraying with a fungicide frequently during wet weather. 
Crown gall is a kind of an interesting looking thing. You, you've seen them on trees in various places. They can affect fruit trees and cane berries, raspberries, blackberries. They're most commonly found on cherry, apple, peach, pear, plum, yonimus, rose, raspberry, and blackberry. It's caused by a bacteria in the soil, soil that infects soil. tissue through wounds on the, crop, on the crown and the roots. Uh, don't replant things that are susceptible to this in the same soil. Uh, plant disease-free materials. Avoid injuries to the bark and roots and crown while you're planting because that's what gives the avenue for this bacteria to invade the plant. And if you have one that's infected, remove and destroy declining plants with large crown galls. And also remove uh, roots and surrounding soil where possible. Uh, prune out the galls when it's practical. Sterilize your pruning tools between cuts so you're not spreading that. And there's no chemical treatment available to homeowners. There's more information on HortSense, which is a great resource uh, sponsored by WSU. And you'll see the link below. Alice will be including links afterwards to a variety of uh, these links that are mentioned here. Pear leaf blister mites. These guys are tiny insects that lay, leaf, lay eggs under leaves. And they cause blistering galls, like these little bumps you see here. Usually they only affect a single tree or a single branch. Uh, remove and destroy infested leaves. Apply oil plus lime sulfur in early spring just prior to bud swell. Examples, there are a couple different kinds of oils here that may be useful and more information on hort scents again. The great erinium mite is caused by a tiny worm-like mite. The upper leaf surface becomes blistered from mites eating leaf and blisters on the lower leaf surface turn white, yellow, and brown. Sprays aren't needed. Dormant oil sprays and wettable sulfur applications used for other pests and sulfur applications for powdery mildew usually control this pest. It doesn't do lasting damage on established vines. Again, there's a resource for hort scents there in the fact sheet. Apple and pear scab, you, we've all seen it on our leaves and on our apples and pears. The way to deal with that is to apply fungicides when leaves are separating, just exposing the bud cluster. Repeat at seven-day intervals for three or more applications until the weather dries. When in blossom, wait until three-quarters of the petals have fallen before applying so you don't kill off bees and pollinators that come. Again, more, in more information on hort scents. Apple anthracnose is the bane of my life. Um, we have had lots of samples around our house. Um, it's a year-round task managing it. The disease. First of all, sanitation. So clean up all leaf and branch debris. Prune affected branches and remove cankers during dry weather year-round. Here you can see a, a, a canker on the, on the upper right in the A picture. And uh, you can cut those out with a knife and cut deep enough to where you are not into infected tissue and remove that. Applying copper-based fungicides every 10 to 14 days to limit or prevent infections during dormant and growing seasons. Monitor trees monthly for new infections and cut out disease tissue and new cankers as they appear. You can see the next stage uh, down on picture B and then on C you can see the fiddle string, the late appearance. It's very destructive to the tree and can kill it as well. <clears throat> peach leaf curl. We, when we first moved here, we planted a peach tree and it promptly died and we didn't know why. We never had that problem before. Obviously, our wet weather makes this, our cold and rainy wet weather makes this a particularly problematic area for peaches. There are several uh, peach, tr uh, peach tree curl resistant uh, trees, Avalon, Frost, we've had pretty good luck with. We haven't tried the others. Indian Free, Mary Jane, and Salish are all supposed to be resistant varieties. Consider growing a peach tree in a movable pot and keeping it out of the rain if you have the space. <laughs> <coughs> Continue applying fungicide at three-week intervals after that while cool and rainy. 
and and bonide fungal fung I don't know even how fungal multipurpose uh, fungicide and the and a couple others are possibilities. Again, if you look on HortSense, you're going to find more. And it's important that you start uh, applying the fungicide in April when 50% of the leaves have fallen. Now weeds, which um, I, I wish we didn't have these guys around here, but we do. There's some great uh, resources on uh, all of these. If you look them up, the plant, uh, Portland, Oregon government uh, has a great site. Um, it helps to ID weeds easily. And another one is the, the next one below. Uh, when you identify it, or just uh, just to look at common Pacific Northwest weeds, HortSense is also a really good resource. And Calais County not just noxious weed list for 20 and 2021 uh, is out there, and it tells you weeds that are harmful to the environment and have an um, impact on our economy as well and uh, tells you how to deal with those. Horsetail um, is, a, is a perennial. Uh, it, it has a creeping root. It's toxic to all horses. It's actually an ancient fern is my understanding. It prefers moist, wet areas, but it can easily adapt to drier ones. Plant, maintaining uh, healthy planting and turf area so you're providing competition will prevent establishment of the horsetail and reduce infestation by hand pulling. Uh, inorganic mulches such as plastic, commercial weed barrier, fabrics, other materials such as roofing paper is an effective weed management option. Um, you can cover inorganic mulches with a thin layer of soil or organic mulch, and that will help prevent photosynthesis occurring and will eventually starve the roots out. As soon as the stems appear, before they're six inches tall, in March and April, remove them. If you do this consistently, you should see your horsetail population reduce. There are several herbicides that are listed for use on horsetail that are available to homeowners, but none of them work particularly well. I spoke with a landscaping person several years ago who said they had actually dug down four feet at, for a person they were working for to try to eliminate the horsetail and didn't succeed. They were using a very powerful um, a chemical that was only available to landscapers and uh, she said, said that had some very specific applications. Obviously we can't use those. So um, applying these uh, mulches and pulling and starving the roots in one way or another are probably your best option. Okay, there's poison hemlock and giant hogweed. Um, they are dangerous plants. Hogweed can cause serious damage. It's huge. Um, and poison hemlock can, can uh, make you or an animal extremely ill within 20 minutes. I remember a story many years ago about some children who made uh, whistles out of poison hemlock stems and died from that. You can compare giant hogweed, car, cow parsnip, and poison hemlock on, these, on this link here just to help you sort them out. And you can compare giant hogweed cow parsnip and angelica on this other link here. Now, here's a sample of, of from one of the websites. So it just gives you a good idea of how tall they are. Like giant hogweed is 15 to 20 feet tall. Um, and it talks about the flower and the shape of the leaf as opposed to cow parsnip. And then poison hemlock, it gives you pictures of the height, which is four to nine feet stem. Um, and just gives you an idea of what you're actually looking at. It's very helpful and very simple, very clear. Now, if you happen to have house plants in your uh, house, then you need to know the light and temperature and watering needs of your plants. I have killed more plants by overwatering and quite a few by underwatering, so I'm, a, I'm an expert at this. Um, it's time to redo now to begin regular watering during the growing season. Most plants require less water in the winter, but they do need it now. So water thoroughly until the water comes out the bottom of the pot. Don't let the pot sit in the water. The roots will drown. More houseplants are killed by overwatering than underwatering. Beginning, uh, begin monthly applications of diluted liquid fertilizer following label instructions. Once a month, 
from March and April through September should keep your plants happy. You can also use worm castings. Excessive fertilizer builds up extra salts and it makes your plants get leggy. This is a good time to repot your plants and to keep them neat and clean trim off the old flowers and the dead leaves. You can lightly prune or pinch the growing tips to make it fuller and it's, not too, it's still too soon to think about moving them out onto your patio. Again, uh, the county extension link has lots of information on houseplant care. Okay, lawns. Uh, this is time to fertilize. This is the first of three times this year in April. The fertilizer should be high in nitrogen, low in phosphorus and potassium. Um, one example would be a 1248. Recommendation for lush green turf, add one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, for example. If you use a fertilizer that's have more weeds that will grow <clears throat> because there's more sunlight available. If you aren't sure what kind of grass you have, set the mowing height to two inches. Keep your mower blades sharp, um, mulch, mulch grass clippings, and return to lawn. Uh, return them to the lawn to restore the nitrogen in the soil. OHSU has 10-minute university handout lawn care, and you have the link there as well. Now, one of the problems that you can run into with lawns is fertilizer runoff. We're having a lot of problems uh, around the world, actually, because of fertilizer runoff. Uh, it causes eutrophication, where um, you have excess nutrients in a body of water. And um, uh, I was reading on Scientific American, there are over 800 studies on this. There are a number of consequences of that that we don't tend to think about when we're fertilizing our lawns. Algae bloom is an overgrowth of algae that can turn water green, brown, red. You've heard, I suspect, of blue-green algae that can have a profound impact on human health. It can cause headaches and skin, respiratory irritation, diarrhea, vomiting, dizziness, liver, kidney damage. Um, it can have devastating effects on pets. For example, if dogs are around, they're likely to drink water with scum and go into extreme distress before we realize it because they can't talk to us. It, al uh, seaweed is also an algae um, and it can grow and now in itself it's not a problem but it can choke out other organisms. One of the problems with overgrowth is oxygen depletion because the algae is using so much of that which then creates dead zones. Um, there, uh, last time I read there were 417 some at least around the world. One in Gulf of Mexico in 2017 was 8,776 square miles in the Gulf of Mexico. That's a lot. Uh, biodiversity uh, goes down because of that. With a lowered oxygen level, it means plants, fish, uh, small animals can't live there and that affects the food chain, which then can drive away otters and herons and offspring and eagles. So just the whole chain is affected. And you can acidify the ocean, which can interfere with shell building and dissolve shells. And you can have nitrate poisoning because this can contaminate the drinking water and it can have especially severe impact on babies. So what can we do? Well, we can leave the lawn kit clippings in place, which, uh, cuts down on the need to fertilize, and it also prevents as much runoff. Uh, if you use a slow-release fertilizer, it will reduce run, runoff again, and it will allow the grass to absorb the fertilizer as it's needed. If you can set your mower blades high, uh, some recommendations are saying three inches or higher to let the grass absorb more water. It develops a more robust system that helps resist drought, so it needs less water, and so therefore there's less runoff, plus it helps to shade out the weeds. Uh, keep fertilizer away from water. Don't fertilize just before rain or over-irrigate so that water runs into the street. Apply mulch. In gardens, uh, you can apply fertilizer directly to the plant roots instead of generally. And then you can cover with two to three inches of mulch, which helps hold the soil mo moisture and helps keep the fertilizer in place even in heavy rainfall. And use the correct type of fertilizer. 
because of the problems we've been talking about, some states are banning phosphorus and fertilizer and only using it for short-term use in new lawns and gardens and use the right amount of fertilizer. And because I'm not real great at figuring out all this, I found this handy-dandy little nitrogen fertilizer calculator. And you can put in the weight of your bag and how much nitrogen and how much you want to cover, and it'll tell you what to do. Very easy. So April, getting your garden ready. Um, there's information on composting for the um, coming season here in this link. Also, if you go to Callitz Co. MG, Callitz County MG, CallitzCoMG.com, you will find uh, classes that we've had on composting. Um, there's seed you need to your garden. There's this on fertilizing. Again, here are more resources. <clears throat> and then when to plant territorial seed has a great uh, uh, growing guide, and you can click on that link, and it will take you to the different plants. And it's, it's excellent. And there are several other guides here that you can use as well. So, ready? Now you can get set and plant. Now that you're, you've read up on how to prepare your garden, you can plant some of the cool weather crops now. Vegetables, and there are a number of them, that germinate in 40 degrees soil temperature. And have you ever thought of taking the temperature of your soil? That might be a useful thing. Uh, those are fava beans and beets, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, Chinese cabbage, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, kale, collard, kohlrabi, leek, <coughs> parsley, radish, rutabaga, pea, Swiss chard, celery, and turnip. You can have a lot growing in your garden starting right now. Lettuce, onions, parsnips, and spinach will germinate at 35 degrees. Carrots, peas, lettuce, kohlrabi, greens, beets, and radishes grow easily from seeds, so you can sow those directly into the soil. And you can go back to that territorial planting guide on the previous page and the other ones for specific directions for cool weather plants. Warm weather plants like tomatoes, squash, and peppers need to wait until the first week of June to plant in our area. You might be able to plant earlier if you pre-warm the soil and provide for warmth and cold protection for your plants. So we have had classes on how to extend growing season, and we'll have another coming up. Um, so there are additional resources. Many of the topics we've covered, especially pruning and pest monitoring, in the last couple of months are also relevant in March, so you might want to go back at looking ahead for January, February, and March. Um, there's home vegetable gardening, WSU site, and there's on uh, house plants. And know that you're not alone. If you don't know what to do something with something, HortSense is a great resource. Um, and be sure you search uh, singular as opposed to plural. So look for apple and not apples because you won't necessarily get the results you want. There are Pacific Northwest handbooks, and here's a link again. And always search for singular. The site is also, it has information for registered pesticide applicators, and you can only follow this, use the stuff for homeowners. And, of course, you can get in touch with us with the Plant and Insect Clinic, which I think is a fabulous resource. So there's the phone number. Um, they're available from 9 to noon, Monday to Friday, and also you can email at callitsmastergardeners at gmail.com. And um, just uh, have a great time gardening. I hope you, I hope you find this sunshine inspiring and that you're off to a great start for this year. Um, here's diagnostic resources, Port Sense, Pest Sense, Pacific Northwest Handbooks. These are all really great resources. Uh, weed management and uh, pests and pest diagnosis clinics, diagnostic clinics, you can find those too. So uh, it's just, there's just so much out there and I hope you have a great uh, April. <laughs>